I've got way too many arcade restoration projects going on at the same time right now. So that's why recently I've been really focused on trying to wrap up as many of them as quickly as possible because I've got a ton more waiting to get started behind them. So, you know, a couple of episodes ago, we completed the Atari Kangaroo restoration project, and that was great. And in today's video, we're going to finish restoring the Pango Arcade Machine from Sega. That's right, this is the final, hopefully, final episode of the Sega Pango restoration. That is, unless something goes wrong. <laughs> I don't want to jinx it. But anyway, we've got a ton of work to do in this video. There's a ton of work to do left. We've got to completely restore that coin door that's all rusty. We've got to completely replace the entire cabinet wiring harness, which is going to be a ton of work. And we need to finish installing, finish in, uh, applying the reproduction art package, which is going to look amazing. So, And there's a bunch more work to do, too. So <laughs> anyway, if that sounds like fun, why don't we head out to the garage and get started? Let's go! Overtime! All right, back on the Pango, and uh, the first thing I want to do right here is restore this coin door. So we're going to take everything apart, take everything off, take all the parts off, uh, we're going to strip off the black paint just because there's a bunch of uh, flaking parts with rust coming through. And even on the inside, um, there's like flaking paint down here in the inside of the door that uh, I don't like at all. So uh, I am going to go the, uh, the whole nine yards here. We'll strip it down to the bare metal and, uh, you know, sand it all off and, you know, paint it with hammered finish and then black paint on top. Uh, get it looking nice and great. I'm not going to worry too much. There's a little bit of uh, rust on the uh, the the, the uh, coin uh, bucket box uh, sort of thing on the bottom, like down here. I'm not really going to worry about that, but uh, yeah, we'll certainly get the outside, the face of it, uh, looking all nice. So uh, the problem is the lower coin door is locked, and I don't have a key. So uh, we're going to open it up the old-fashioned way uh, with a power drill. So. I've done this a bunch of times before. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever actually done it in a video. So uh, basically I've got a black oxide uh, drill bit. I think this is a 1 8 inch uh, drill bit on my power drill. And we're just going to line it up here uh, in the lock and drill it until basically we feel the lock uh, kind of uh, fall apart. Um, I usually do this while the, uh, the coin door is on the cabinet, but this time it's just hanging out. So yeah, why don't we just uh, <laughs> line it up and uh, go for broke. It's a tough one. Mm. There we go. Lots of uh, shavings here. Uh, I don't think I damaged the drill bit. It will get a bit hot. I don't know if you saw a little bit of, little bit of smoke there, but here we go. Our coin door is open. We basically, you know, drill through the, uh, uh, the lock and it kind of all falls apart. There's some sort of sticker in here. Look at that. Uh, coin controls quality sticker. We'll kind of remount that uh, on the inside and Let's see if, there anything, if there's anything neat inside of here. Oh, it's a metal bucket. I was not expecting that. That's kind of interesting. Uh, nothing in here except, I believe this is the, uh, um, from the upper cam lock, the cam and the, uh, the nut. But uh, is there anything inside of there? I don't think so. A <laughs> bunch of dead bugs, dead stink bugs, but... And we've got our, I'll show you here. We've got our coin counter is actually uh, mounted in here. I knew there were some wires and this is what I assumed was going on there. But yeah, we've got 15,786 on the coin counter. So we'll ask Professor Pac-Man to do the math and tell us uh, how many quarters were collected by this 
uh, cabinet back in the day. So yeah, so uh, so that's cool. Clean buckets off. We'll clean up all these metal shaving swap. Yeah, I was not expecting a metal coin box. Usually they're, you know, like a plastic bucket. So yeah, we'll clean up all this stuff. I can still feel it's a little bit warm. And then, uh, like I said, I'll take everything off. I'll take the individual coin doors off. I'll take all of the uh, coin mech stuff off the top. It's just a couple of screws holding it in place. Take the old uh, locks off. Uh, there are little uh, screws in here that hold the uh, faces of the doors onto the frame, uh, and then there are little uh, bolts on the inside here holding the, um, the box for the coin bucket uh, onto the bottom. So I'll go ahead and take all that off and then we'll get to stripping. Okay, the coin door is completely disassembled. Everything came apart relatively easily, no problems, nothing, you know, rusted on or really stuck or anything like that. So. I've got all the you know parts and pieces and nuts and bolts and all that in the coin bucket. Again, this is a metal coin bucket, which is I guess kind of neat. And uh, here is the uh, box, the lower box uh, with the coin mech sort of uh, housing uh, up top and the harness there. It's been hacked up a bit, but uh, we'll get that back working uh, good as new. And then over here uh, are the upper and lower coin doors themselves. The coin door frame and some of the uh, the hardware like the uh, um, the coin slot bezels and the coin reject bezels and flaps, which are all metal. So uh, I coated those with a uh, <laughs> generous amount of uh, good old reliable citrus strip. And uh, because I, I kind of want to let this run overnight, um, and uh, the instructions on the citrus strip, citrus strip container say if you're going to do that. Uh, throw some saran wrap on that just to keep it from drying out. So that's what I'm going to do. So I've got a good layer here of saran wrap sort of covering everything. And I'm going to let this go at least overnight, perhaps almost for a whole day, depending on how, how uh, my morning goes tomorrow. Uh, and then we'll come back and uh, hopefully be able to pretty easily wipe off all of the paint. And then we'll flip it over, do the backside probably. And uh, then we'll be ready to uh, repaint and then ultimately reassemble this coin door. Okay, it's the next morning, and uh, I'm hoping this stuff just sloughs right off of the uh, control panel. And yeah, I can see it's uh, looking pretty good. I mean, it's looking nasty, but <laughs> it's coming right off. Yeah, look at that. Okay, that worked really well. Well, in some spots. Okay, okay. What do you think? Do a get off of there. Do a time lapse of uh, all this coming off? Yeah, how about that? All right, uh, a lot of it came off, but uh, there's quite a bit of uh, stubborn paint, so I could just take my wire wheel uh, to it and clean it all off, but uh, I think while I'm at work, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put another application of, uh, of citrus strip on and let that do its job, and then I'll probably still have to clean it up a little bit with, uh, with the wire wheel, so hopefully this part is a bit more compliant. Oh, look at that. That's nasty. Uh, I don't know if this, maybe this was repainted at least once and that's why it's so gross. Look at this. They're like little, uh, I don't even know what to call it. Like little <laughs> veins of rust. I don't know what that even is.
All right, we've got our second application of citrus strip on, covered up in saran wrap. I'm gonna let this sit while I'm at work and then I'll come home and uh, we'll take a look at what we got. Okay, that second application of citrus strip took off most of the, most of the paint. Uh, I did then wipe it all off, clean it all off, hosed it off, uh, and then came back with my wire wheel to kind of clean up the rest, uh, particularly the, the, the rust, that weird sort of almost worm looking rust pattern on both of the, both of the coin doors. Uh, and I think the frame is like cast aluminum maybe. Um, and I couldn't get into every single crevice, but not too worried about that. Um, a little bit of sandpaper kind of helped to, to clean it up. So uh, we're gonna come back and try to recreate the uh, hammered finish with, again, Rust-Oleum Universal Hammered Paint and Primer in one in black. You've seen me use this multiple times before. Uh, one of the issues with this paint is it doesn't really come out fully black, even though the, the can says black, it really comes out as more of like a steel. So. Um, we'll have to eventually come over the top with, uh, you know, black, uh, uh, satin paint. And, uh, yeah, uh, the other issue is, um, you really got to do light coats with this. Otherwise it'll kind of look like, uh, the texture is melted. And if you look at, uh, the can itself, if it'll show up on camera, it's got, it'll come, it'll create this sort of kind of like a hammered finish, uh, because the original coin doors were textured. They did have a texture to them. They are not perfectly smooth. So uh, I've got the end of one can ready to go. I've got a second one shaken up. So we'll come in here with our uh, light coats and I'll probably do like three light coats. And what's hard is in the dark, especially with a can that's almost empty, it's hard. And I'm actually gonna ditch this can. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to see where the paint is going again because it is so you know it's really more steel colored and you're painting you know bare metal so hopefully we'll get more uh <laughs> a better view with uh this new can there we go there we go yeah that already looks better again keeping our distance and then we're gonna try to do lighter coats so that we don't have that issue. Um, and I'm thinking three coats is the way to go here. And I got, again, I gotta be careful with the corners of the frame so I don't have the issue like I had with the, uh, the Ms. Pack uh, coin door. You know, we don't really have to get super thorough coverage with this because again we're just using this to create the texture uh, the color will really come from um, the uh, the black paint at the end all right that's looking okay i think i can do a little bit more here so i think that's good for my first coat like i said i'll do Two more of this, uh, we'll let it dry a day, and then we'll be ready to throw the black paint uh, over the top. Okay, while that paint's drying, I wanted to turn my attention back to the cabinet, and there's actually a piece here uh, that's missing that I don't have, and it's the lower uh, marquee bracket. So the way the marquee is mounted on Pango and similar Sega uh, cabinets, there's kind of a, a slit up here in the top of the cabinet. There's some T molding that goes right here. So there is no upper uh, marquee bracket. There's just a lower one that kind of mounts underneath here. There's a lip uh, cut into the panel here. The uh, marquee sort of fits into the slot at the top and just hangs out in this panel. And then there's supposed to be a bracket that kind of wraps around like an L shape like this and uh, uh, holds it in place. Uh, but mine is missing. It wasn't here when I got this uh, cabinet. So no problem, I will just fabricate one, right? So uh, I grabbed uh, a piece of angle aluminum here just from uh, Ace Hardware, like I've, I've done multiple times to make uh, marquee brackets and you know, you cut it to size, drill holes. But the problem is, <laughs> is that this is not a 90 degree bend here. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it uh, sort of from, from this angle, um, but the the, this panel is coming in at an angle, so it's not just like a straight L-bend, you know, 90 degree. It's actually more like 110 degrees. 
And uh, yeah, so I was able to get some help from uh, Overtime Arcade channel member Taylor, who goes by Dillweed on the Claw forums and Discord and, and all over the place. And he's got a YouTube channel that I'll, I'll link down below uh, called The Dillist Weed. Uh, he's got a Pango just like me, and he's got all the original uh, parts, including that lower bracket. So not only did he take the measurements that I needed, he actually drew up this really, really cool drawing diagram thing that I'll, I'll post up on the screen here showing me exactly what I need. Uh, all of the measurements, how I need to, to cut this piece of aluminum, uh, how I need to bend it to open it up to 110 degrees, where I need to drill the holes. Just so awesome, so perfect. Taylor Dillweed, thank you so much. This was awesome. And uh, I'll make sure that that, uh, that drawing, that diagram is available uh, to Overtime Arcade channel members uh, on our, our private members only Discord. So. Yeah, what I did was I went and I, I bought a piece of one by one inch, you know, angle aluminum. And yeah, um, the, the two big things there are, you know, this is not actually supposed to be one by one, the actual bracket. It's one inch going vertically, but it's only seven eighths of an inch uh, sort of going backwards. But I figure one by one is close enough. And you're never going to notice that extra eighth of an inch sort of on the underside here. Uh, but the biggest issue was how am I going to uh, bend this thing from 90 degrees and open it up to 110? The right way would probably be to buy some sort of, of break, uh, like a, a tool called a break, a metal break for opening up or bending metal. Uh, but I didn't want to do that. So on the cheap, what I ended up doing, I saw a, a video on YouTube. I actually think the guy that posted it uh, is active in the sort of uh, model aviation, you know, building kit planes right, like RC planes, um, you know, from scratch. And uh, he showed sort of how to do this with just a, uh, a vise, right? So uh, I dug out my vise that I haven't had mounted since I lived at my old place and it's still not mounted, it's just loose. And basically I'll, I'll link to his video down below. You know, uh, you, hold the, you hold the bracket uh, in the vise, right? And you use some wood to kind of brace it so you don't like, uh, uh, you know, scratch up the metal and whatever. You hold it, you hold it kind of like this, and then you use uh, the claw of your hammer to pry it open, bend it open, if you can visualize that. So the, the bracket was, you know, uh, clamped into the, the vise, right? Sort of like that. And I went with my, uh, the claw of my hammer and bent it up a little bit at a time. I used a, just a, a protractor that I kind of borrowed from uh, uh, one of my kids uh, from their school bag. Uh, to kind of measure uh, uh, the angle to make sure I was in the neighborhood of 110 degrees. Uh, and then I drilled the holes uh, where they needed to be. And here's the finished product, right? It's not perfect. You can see, especially in the, the glint uh, of the light, you know, there's a lot of sort of marks where I, I bent in, and especially on the inside, you can sort of see where the, the claw of the hammer marred that metal. But it's going to get mounted into the cabinet uh, just like this, and you are never going to notice uh, any problem, right? And look how nice that looks right there. And again, I've drilled the holes exactly where they need to go based on Taylor on Dillweed's uh, uh, measurements, his, uh, uh, his diagram, and yeah, so this is now going to be our lower marquee bracket uh, that we did for a couple of bucks, uh, no specialized tools. You know, all you need is a vise and a drill and a hammer and uh, you know, a $1 protractor that you can steal from your kids and uh, yeah, I think we'll be good to go here. Uh, I dug out a couple of uh, wood screws that we can uh, use to, to mount the thing. And so uh, now all I need to do is paint this black with uh, good old Rust-Oleum uh, Universal Satin Black and uh, we'll be good to go. So why don't I go ahead and do that and I'll paint the, uh, the coin doors, I'll paint over the hammered finish with that black. We'll do that to the, uh, the coin doors, to the marquee bracket, to the screws, and uh, we should be all set. Okay, and while that paint is drying, we're gonna turn our attention back to the inside of the cabinet and uh, this mess of wiring. So if you recall when I got this cabinet, which again, I got for free, uh, it had been converted to Time Soldiers, originally a dedicated Pango, then converted over to Time Soldiers, which is a JAMA game. Uh, and it was working, or at least we were able to get it to work once we put that new switching uh, power supply in uh, and everything was fine. Um, but, uh, you know, once I came around to the back and really took a closer look at what was going on with this JAMA harness, again, because the original Pango harness was removed, it was converted to JAMA, so the Pango 
uh, you know, old linear power supply was removed, replaced with a switcher, and the, the Pango harness was ripped out and replaced with the JAMA harness. But even this JAMA harness is just not in good shape. You can see a bunch of places where uh, the wiring was spliced and uh, spliced and reconnected with just, you know, electrical tape over the, over the connections, I think just sort of twisted uh, together. We've got a bunch of wires cut back here and uh, let's see, yeah, right here and just like hanging out and, um, you know, exposed and there's like an exposed splice right here. And I I'm just, I, I can't have that, right? So I don't want that uh, in my cabinet, in my house. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rip this JAMA harness out uh, completely. I'm going to rip it out completely and, uh, you know, I'm going to go through and we'll leave a bunch of stuff. We'll leave the isolation transformer. We'll leave the junction box up here, you know, and the rest of the, the cabinet wiring that goes to like the speakers and the marquee light and that sort of thing. But we're going to get rid of this, uh, this entire uh, JAMA harness just because it's in, it's in too bad of shape, right? Even like wires cut on the on the edge connector and just, you know, bad news. So uh, also while I've got everything out, I'm gonna give the inside of the cabinet a good uh, cleaning, scrubbing, you know, vacuuming, that sort of thing. We'll get it nice and clean. And what we're gonna replace it with is over here. So I've got a brand new JAMA harness uh, from The Real Bob Roberts. And say what you will, Bob makes a really nice JAMA harness. So I've got a, br a brand new one here, all nice and labeled. Um, yeah, uh, uh, multicolor wiring and uh, really uh, looks great here. I've also got Bob's uh, super, super accessory kit with a lot of the extra things uh, that we'll need here. I've got a, a video harness if we need it. I've got a, a whole bunch of, of uh, zip ties to uh, hold everything together as I'm watching Brandon's uh, stream on Twitch. But uh, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and redo all the wiring uh, in the cabinet, ripping out the old, uh, you know, just completely hacked up uh, JAMA harness, uh, cleaning it up and yeah, installing a, a brand new one. I'll get everything wired up. I'll plug in the, uh, the control panel and the marquee light and just uh, uh, everything. And at that point we'll be ready to test and hopefully everything's working. Here's something weird I found. So I've stripped out the, uh, the JAMA harness and I'm kind of reviewing the remnants of the original power harness. Uh, from the Pango cabinet, and I'm trying to account for uh, everything. And uh, everything seems to be pretty good. It's, it's all lining up and what I'm expecting, except for this right here. Uh, so this is a, a, a two pin connector uh, marked P11. I think it's AC. And I don't see it anywhere on the uh, cabinet wiring diagram that I printed from the manual. Uh, <laughs> it's not accounted for anywhere. Uh, it kind of branches off um, from the main AC lines coming off of the isolation transformer, similar to here how uh, P16 comes off for the uh, the marquee light, but this sort of branching with these uh, wire nuts shows like two wires coming out and there's actually three coming out of each of those wire nuts. So I'm not sure what this is for. Dilly thought it might've been an extension for P16, but I've already got an extension for P16 going to the marquee light. So uh, no idea what this connector P11 is supposed to be for. Check it out, quick update on my progress here of uh, rewiring the cabinet. And again, uh, I'm keeping this as a JAMA cabinet just because I don't have the original power supply and I don't have the original harness, um, you know, and have been converted to a, a JAMA setup and a switching power supply when it was converted to Time Soldiers or sometime in the past. And I'm gonna keep it that way, at least for now. Um, but I am replacing the JAMA harness just because the, the one that was there was a bit hacked up. I've got a brand new one here from Bob Roberts. And uh, I'd say things are going pretty pretty good. One of the things I'm doing to make uh, everything a bit easier for myself is I've kind of separated all the different parts uh, of the harness into these little baggies just to kind of isolate and focus on what I'm doing sort of one uh, uh, piece at a time. Uh, I've got the, uh, the cabinet wiring diagram here from the manual and I've got a detailed uh, pin out. I'm not exactly sure where this is from. Uh, it's, it's off of Clove, but um, so I think we're, we're going pretty good here. If we come over to the cabinet, I have uh, rewired the control panel. I sort of created a brand new uh, control panel harness. And yeah, I use quick, uh, quick uh, disconnects, which is you know not the right way to do it. You really should solder for a good connection, but uh, <laughs> so this is not necessarily the right way. One of the things that I am trying to do though is 
uh, uh, make the, the, the harness as original as possible. So I am using the sort of same uh, connectors that were here before, right? And so like, the, this is how it was originally, you know, the, the, the control panel harness would go into this connector mounted on the underside of the control panel. And then this piece from the, uh, the harness, uh, the main harness would plug in like so. And uh, so yeah, I'm trying to follow the original as close as possible. I've got the, the colors pretty much accurate here with some uh, differences and I'll do the same kind of, you know, plugging everything uh, into here. So taking the, the jammer wiring that has been, you know, through the adapter coming off of the Pango PCB and sort of, um, you know, following and, and this end, the, the, the pinout that Pango expects. So we'll make it as uh, close as possible. Uh, sort of rebuilt the coin door here. Everything's looking good there. I've got the uh, coin door and uh, utility, utility panel connector P2 down there. Again, I'm trying to keep that as original as possible. So I've got a, a matching uh, connector that'll, you know, I'll pin this with the, uh, with the JAMA harness and get it plugged in there. And everything's pretty good. Um, you know, I, I do have the volume control knob uh, disconnected just because on JAMA there is no volume control on the harness that all goes through the PCB. So yeah. Um, <laughs> I think we're making pretty good progress and really what I'm, I'm about to do now on this uh, beautiful windy uh, uh, early, I guess, yeah, early fall day in Virginia is it's time to crimp pins onto all of the, the, the wires um, from the wiring harness and then uh, plug it all back together and we should be ready to test. So uh, I'll come back in a bit and we'll be ready to do that. Okay, about a hundred crimps and a hundred zip ties later, and I think I think we're ready to test this thing. So I've doubled and, and triple checked everything, and uh, I think I think we're in good shape. I've got everything connected. Um, before I really go to town and you know do a bunch of the uh, the sort of permanent cable management, kind of getting everything looking really nice. Um, uh, I've got a, a 60 in one in plugged into the into the JAMA harness, um, figuring you know this is what I'm going to use for testing, and I can you know change anything if if necessary. And the reason I'm using a 60 in one is if anything goes wrong, if anything goes catastrophically wrong, I want that thing to be the sacrificial lamb that that ends up dying and not my you know original uh, uh, Pango board. So oh, I <laughs> I think we're ready to go. So. Let me go ahead and plug in the cabinet. And everything should be wired up so that if I pull this interlock switch, we should have the 60 in one start booting. Three, two, one. Okay. Uh, no fireworks. Heard the speaker pop. Um, and yeah, we've got something going on the screen here. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Come on over here. Come on over here. Here we go. Look at that. All right. What the heck is going on? Why is it backwards? Why is it backwards? Do I have the yoke wires flipped? but I've tested this monitor before. How in the world is it backwards? You see what I'm talking about? Like the, the text is backwards. This thing is, is flipped on the, the vertical axis. Well, really it's, this is the vertical axis because the, the monitor, <laughs> why is it backwards? Oh my goodness. And it's loud. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Why is it backwards? Okay. <laughs> Everything's fine. I fixed it. <laughs> it's just super loud. I gotta turn the volume down on that 60 and one. So I, I actually went back and watched the, rewatched the video that I made where you know, we did the tube swap uh, on this uh, 60 in one. No, we did the tube swap on the G07 because I necked the original tube that was in this in this cabinet that had the uh, the Pango burn and the Time Soldiers burn. And I went back and watched that video again. And sure enough, even when I had the TPG hooked up to it, 
the uh, vertical axis of the monitor, and again, this is a vertically oriented monitor, so the vertical is sort of sideways here. The vertical axis, axis was inverted. So I did have those yoke wires in backwards, so I went in and uh, flipped the yoke wires at the yoke connector, and everything is back to normal. You can read game over there just fine. Uh, and Ms. Pac-Man for the 60-in-1, but oh, goodness, goodness gracious. So uh, what do we know right now? Well, we know that that sound is way too loud. <laughs> Let me uh, take care of that real quick. Okay, that's much better. <laughs> Let's see, do the controls work? Yeah. Left, right, down, up. Let's go over to uh, actually pick Pango. Whoops. Oh, skipped right past it, didn't I? Where is it? There we go. There we go. Look at that. Pango. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we don't need to play the uh, 60 in one version of Pango, but it works. I checked the voltages also, and we're at a good rock solid five volts. So, uh, I'd say uh, this, uh, <laughs> the JAMA rewiring was a success. And uh, yeah, let me, um, let me go and uh, get set to put the Pango PCB into the cabinet. All right, here's my Pango PCB, which, you know, we've tested out. We know it's working, even though one of the uh, EEPROM sort of windows, the sticker has been taken off. Um, but you know, I really, really want the, uh, the hot butter popcorn music. So Pango came out in two different versions. There was an early version, an early revision, an early ROM revision that had the really great hot butter popcorn, uh, music. Uh, but apparently Sega only had a license for that music in Japan. So they quickly released a updated ROM revision that had a, a different music. And there were some other small differences too, but you know, to me, it's not Pango without the hot butter popcorn uh, music. So what I've got right here is uh, a kit from highscoresaves.com. This is the Pango kit. And this does a bunch of different things. This gives us, you know, the ability to save high scores. It gives us improved free play and all these sort of, um, you know, controls. But for me, the big thing that I want is it allows you to select the hot butter popcorn music or the other one. So very, very simple to install this thing. We're gonna remove the Z80 processor very gently uh, from the sockets here. I'm gonna to try to do this without obviously damaging anything. I've got my handy dandy chip uh, puller tool. And uh, you can also use a flathead screwdriver or whatever uh, for this. And I'm just gently prying it out of the socket. Whoops, don't do that, Charlie. <laughs> Very gently prying it out, going slowly. Don't want to risk damaging this, you know, 41 year old chip. Uh, I don't know when the Z80 came out, but Pango came out in 82. So this would be a 41 year old game. Uh, okay, come on, come on, there we go. And we are out. And uh, just take a look at the legs and make sure we didn't damage any. And now we're going to transplant it onto uh, the socket on the high score save kit. And you've seen me do this before, but I'm being very, very careful to line this up in a way where I can insert the chip and not bend any of the legs because that would be bad, bad news. Okay, I think we're, I think we're pretty good here. All right, and our Z80 has been transplanted. I've got the right orientation, just making sure that it's all the way in. 
Okay, and we are good. So I can go ahead and install this kit back into the PCB. And again, I'm being very careful to line it up. Let's actually pick it up and take a real close look. All right, I think everything is good to go. And I'm gonna gently push it in. Okay. And that should do it. So uh, let's go ahead and stick this in the cabinet and make sure it works. All right, there's the high score saves kit installed on the PCB and the PCB installed into the cabinet. And using the <laughs> PCBJunkie.net JAMA adapter, we have plugged our Pango PCB into the new JAMA wiring harness. And uh, yeah, I think we're ready to fire this puppy up and give it an initial test uh, of that high score save kit. So we'll just come around here to the front and we'll get on the, if it wants to cooperate, we'll get on the tripod here. Sorry, it's late and I'm losing my mind. So there we go. I think all I have to do now oh, is pull this uh, interlock switch, three, two, one. And we'll see what comes up on that screen. Hopefully some kind of pango. And <laughs> that ain't right. That ain't right. What is going on? I just rebooted it and this is what I'm getting now. That's even worse. But the fact that it's, I, and all I did was I, I, let me try reseating both of these connectors. Oh my goodness. All right, I've reseated the, uh, the JAMA adapter and the JAMA harness. And we're just getting more garbage on the screen. This board was working before. Let me, let me try a couple things. Well, I got good news and bad news and more bad news. <laughs> so the good news is my PCB still works, as you can see. Uh, the bad news is, for the life of me, I couldn't get the high score saves kit to work. And the other bad news is the image is upside down. And you saw this. <laughs> The 60 and one board was flipped fine. It was looking fine, right? We had it, you know, sort of uh, swapped side to side, but we fixed that by swapping the yoke wires. But now it's, I mean, it's hard to see now, but like, cause it's in this weird attract mode, but this is, this image is upside down. Okay. And it's jumpy when it flips like that. But yeah, see that game board, that's, that's upside down. The high score is down here. It's, it's wrong. So <laughs> I'm going nuts. So like I said, for the life of me, I couldn't get the high score saves kit to work. I tried a whole bunch of stuff uh, and multiple times, you know, uh, uh, uninstalled it, reinstalled it. I just can't get it to, to boot. It boots to garbage. Uh, the only thing I didn't try was removing all of the, the game uh, ROMs, uh, the original game ROMs on the PCB. Um, and I don't really want to do that. That is uh, uh, allegedly optional. But uh, I don't want to do that just because I don't want to mess with eight uh, <laughs> socketed chips right now. So uh, I'll, I'll contact uh, highscoresaves.com uh, and uh, I'm sure they can uh, uh, help me out. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Anyway, so, you know, uh, removed it, reinstalled it, and uh, removed the, uh, the high score saves kit, reinstalled the Z80 processor on the PCB. And the PCB is running fine. But apparently, Sega's image is flipped. So maybe that's why the original uh, G07 um, yoke wires were all uh, chopped up. That connector was, if you remember, like broken into multiple pieces. And, and yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to undo the flip that I just did and uh, uh, flip the other uh, uh, axis. And I'll come back and hopefully we'll have 
Pango running in the correct orientation on this monitor. Okay. <laughs> I've swapped the yoke wires again, and uh, <laughs> everything should be good now. So three, two, one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, I... <laughs> Ah, there we go. Sega, squash the snow bees. There's Pango attract mode. Oh my goodness. Oh, can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. Looks good, right? Yeah, oh my gosh. Uh, I might have to make some adjustments. You know, I think the, I don't know. Um, Geometry needs a little bit of adjusting, but um, yeah, and this is that weird uh, tube that I swapped in. Yeah, I should shift the image over a little bit and down. Why don't I? I'll mess with that uh, on my own, but uh, let's just uh, try coining up. Uh, right. Come on. There we go. One credit. Clearly. Okay. Something's not right with that uh, right coin mech. I'm going to have to investigate it. But let's go ahead and start a game. <sighs> Sound works. Right, down, left, down, up. Die. <laughs> let's test the buttons. Ugh. Oh. Double check that right one. And, uh, okay, get out of here. Get out of here, moth. All right. Uh, and I'm gonna try, I'll coin up again and we'll, um, come on, get out of here. I wanna, um, ooh. I might need to adjust the leaf switches on the uh, joystick, but it's all se it all seems to be working. Uh, again, let me just ditch my last life here, and uh, we'll uh, coin up uh, enough for, come on, here we go, there's a two-player game. Maybe it's got some sort of, um, I, I don't know, I don't know what's going on with crediting, but hey, game is working, <laughs> controls are working, some of the credit switches are working, I don't know, but uh <sighs> so here's my plan. Uh, I need to go to bed. It's 3 a.m. I'll get up in the morning when it warms up. We'll put the art kit on, and uh, I think we'll call this project done for now. So uh, stay tuned for that uh, grand finale. Okay, I gave the cabinet another good scrubbing, and uh, I installed a new set of locks and put the back door back on the cabinet. So I think we are ready to install some artwork. So we'll start with the bezel. This is a cardboard bezel that's designed to go under glass, uh, protecting the monitor, of course. And uh, this is obviously a reproduction and I got it from this old game. Uh, and you know the way this sort of bezel works is it ships flat, uh, but it's got these contours uh, that are supposed to kind of, you know, uh, hug the uh, the curvature of the CRT tube and uh, we get to assemble this so it's, uh, it's got sort of uh, one big piece with these side wings that are scored we'll bend those sort of open them up and then we've got these two pieces to put on the um, the top and the bottom uh, to kind of you know complete that uh, move and I'm going to very gently sort of follow uh, these score marks maybe coming from underneath will be a little bit uh, better and we're trying to open this thing up without damaging it. So, let's uh, move over to the cabinet itself. Take a look at what's going on over here. And I'll bring the bezel back. We'll pop that sucker on. All right.
Look at that. How does that look? <laughs> I think that looks pretty cool. And I've got my glass bezel, which has been mostly cleaned. I always wait to do the final pass on the front until it's on the cabinet. Come on. Okay. All right, that looks pretty good. Let's close our control panel. It's funny, that actually covers up the uh, <laughs> Sega uh, copyright mark, and I was kind of wondering why it was so low to the, to the, uh, the edge, the bottom edge. And I'm just closing up the control panel brackets. All right, we'll give that glass a quick wipe down. Some paper towel and uh, yeah, Troy from Troy's Restorations put me onto this. I've mentioned it before, Sprayway foaming glass cleaner. Uh, good stuff. So trying not to get it all over the place, but all right. We're looking like Pango now, huh? <laughs> Maybe it's too much of this glass cleaner, but it evaporates pretty quick. I like the foaming action, help with the cleaning. Look at that. Another piece of paper towel. And out of boom. We are coming together now. All right. Uh, also, while I uh, was cleaning everything, I threw a replacement bulb uh, into the top. I think it's a F15 T8 uh, cool white. Um, I did have one extra, it was used and it's kind of on its last leg, but it'll have to do until I make it out to uh, Ace Hardware or uh, place an order online. Look at that. That's great. Look at that. Let's back up and admire this a little bit. Okay. And uh, up top, another thing I can do is mount our marquee. So this is actually an original that I got on eBay. It's in really, really nice shape. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and put this sucker on. I've cleaned this as well. And uh, marquee here. Mounts in a relatively unique way. There's no top bracket. There's only a bottom bracket. There's kind of a, a groove that it fits into on the top. I'll grab my screwdriver and the, the lower marquee bracket that we made out of some angle aluminum. And uh, we'll pop this on real quick. It's my freshly painted <laughs> screws. All right. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> that looks fantastic. It's not even turned on yet. Oh wow. I am <laughs> getting excited. We're almost done. We're almost done. This video is taking so long. Uh, it's actually Sunday afternoon, and I usually have these videos out, at least to the public, on Sundays at 3, and typically to uh, uh, Overtime Arcade channel members on Saturdays for uh, early access viewing, but this, the final parts of this project have just taken too long. Um, so now my plan is right in there. totally to have this done completely by this evening and uh, <laughs> get it to my channel members uh, by tonight and uh, yeah get it to my channel members by tonight and wow look at that uh, and then tomorrow I think what I'm going to do because tomorrow is actually the one year anniversary 
of the first uh, videos being released on my channel. So I don't know if you want to call that the channel birthday. So I'm gonna, I think I'm going to do a, a little live stream to celebrate. We'll play some games, including Pango. Uh, and then once that uh, live stream concludes, we'll wrap up with a premiere of this episode. So if you're watching this, that live stream has probably already happened. And uh, you can go uh, on your own and, and watch the recap of that. But uh, yeah, look how good that looks with the marquee and the bezel and the control panel. Just, uh, just awesome, awesome artwork. And speaking of artwork, we've got one last step just right over here on the, on the, <laughs> the folding table. I've got the two panels of Pango side art for either side. Uh, I've got them out. They're fold, they're, um, it's unrolled. I've got some weights and some paint cans and cans of Bondo and stuff. I'm going to let this sort of flatten out for a little bit. I'm going to go down to the basement. I will uh, edit the whole video except for this last part. And then uh, we'll come back here when the side art is kind of relaxed and ready to go and we will install it on the cabinet. All right, the side art decals flattened out pretty nicely, pretty easily and quickly. So I think we're ready to take this final step and apply them to the sides of the cabinet. Uh, I went ahead and kind of fixed them in the right position. You know, this is kind of the technique to use here, which is, you know, line it up exactly where you want it to be and then kind of secure it in place with uh, painter's tape. So I've kind of done that here and I'm going to be focusing on the top part. We will affix the top uh, half uh, and then use that to kind of hold, uh, hold the whole thing there as we affix the bottom half after that. If we come over to the, whoa, to the other side here, you'll see uh, <laughs> the exact same mirror image on uh, this side of the cabinet. So I lined it all up, you know, made made some measurements and we're essentially perfectly aligned here. So I think we'll just go ahead and uh, get this mounted. So I've got the tools that I need for that over here. Obviously the instructions from this old uh, game. Got my bottle of Rapid Tac because yes, I will be using the wet method. I've got some paper towels to wipe up any mess. Uh, I've got my vinyl squeegee ready to go, very important tool. And I've got a brand new X-Acto knife here uh, uh, on standby, just in case I need to do some emergency surgery to this, uh, to this uh, uh, side art. But hopefully, hopefully it won't come to that. So we'll get set up over here and uh, get into it. So uh, Rapid Attack is both a cleaner and sort of a, uh, it says application uh, fluid on the bottle. I've already cleaned both sides with Rapid Attack, and that was after I already cleaned them with uh, Simple Green and the Rapid Attack helps, you know, it's mostly alcohol and I think some soap in it, but uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's just to shake it, which I always forget to do. I always forget to shake it. <laughs> So what we'll do is um, uh, we'll actually spray the, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the mask uh, here. Actually, we'll do that at the end. We'll spray the mask at the end because you don't peel that off until the end. You know, sort of there's this kind of protective layer on top of the, uh, uh, the, the sticker itself, the decal itself. Um, but we'll spray the inside that'll help remove the backing from it. And, this, and the, um, the wrap attack helps, you know, smooth out bubbles. It gives you a little bit more time. It keeps the adhesive from really sticking instantly so that you can smooth out those bubbles and, and you know, with your squeegee and get them out. So uh, yeah, why don't, we, uh, why don't we go for it? So we'll pull it down like this and we'll have the top half just dangling there. I forgot to grab my scissors. Let me grab those off the pegboard real quick. So we're good to go there. And uh, I'm gonna spray uh, both sides down. So I'm spraying the backing paper, getting that all wet. And we've got the uh, cabinet wet. And you want it nice and, uh, you know, nice and uh, soaked there. So I can get rid of this painter's tape. We don't need that piece. And uh, yeah, we are <laughs> gonna go for it. So we'll peel back the backing paper that come down to about where the painter's tape is. And then we'll come in with our scissors. I'm 
and try to cut as straight a line as possible. All right. Maybe just a little bit more for good measure. And starting from the bottom with our, with our squeegee, we are putting the artwork onto the cabinet. And you know, like I said, the, the wet method just gives you, look at it squeezing out, so much more margin for air to get this on because if you aren't using the wet method, once that adhesive makes contact with the cabinet, you don't want to take it off again. So this, you know, if worst came to worst came to worse and there was a, you know, a terrible mistake, <laughs> like I put the wrong uh, decal on the wrong side, right? We would have an opportunity to pull it off, pull off the side art and reapply. But if you do that with the, without using the wet method, you are done. Once it's on, it's on. And there's also sometimes bubbles in the, the mask, which is not what we're worried about. The mask also protects the, the decal, the side art, as I'm dragging the squeegee across. And squeegee has this kind of, you know, felt strip on it to make it uh, softer too, but the pre-mask also protects, protects the side art from getting scratched or whatever. I'm not seeing any air bubbles. I'm not seeing any wrap attack coming out. Okay, so uh, the top half is done and on, and that should hold should hold the uh, the rest or should hold the the decal in place while we apply the uh, bottom half. There we go. Okay, being careful not to destroy any of that. Oh, this is always, you know, a little bit nerve wracking, but, um, you know, I, <laughs> I'd much rather be doing these than, you know, the stencils. And I'm, if I'm being honest, I'm kind of Again, dreading the Ms. Pack stencils, and so I'm worried about getting the right uh, paint codes because the old tried and tested paint codes, um, I forget which uh, paint company it was, but they changed their, uh, their, they changed how their paint works, and so those paint codes are no longer valid anymore, so I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I'm worried about, you know, have I, have I missed my window now with the, uh, the temperature coming down? Because it's, you know, I think it should, it's going to be in the 40s overnight here. So, uh, all right, uh, we're going to go for the bottom half here. Take off this. There we go. And again, we will spray down. Oops, I don't have to do that side yet. Spray down here. That helps the backing come off. Make it nice and wet down here and yeah I'm gonna hold my squeegee in my mouth while I remove the backing and then we'll start applying it okay attack and okay 
Now we come down with the squeegee. This always reminds me of putting like a screen protector on a cell phone. <laughs> but obviously a much, much larger scale and it's not, you know, you know, you're not gluing glass to glass like you are with that. This is going to look awesome. I hope so. There we go. There was an air bubble we got out thanks to the wrap attack. Okay. Yeah, you can hear it sort of popping out. There's another one right there. There's two of them. I don't know if I want to try. Oh yeah, I think I can get it. Yeah, okay. Whoop. This cabinet's on a furniture dolly and it wants to, wants to roll. There we go, okay. <laughs> And I kind of got myself there with a little bit of the wrap attack, but that's fine. I got garage clothes on, not nice clothes. Yeah, sorry if I dress like a slob on camera most of the time, but I never know what, you know, dirty, dangerous, whatever type of stuff I'm doing, and I don't want to ruin, oh, I don't want to ruin nice clothes. So you'll often see me wearing just gross, gross work clothes or workshop clothes almost. We got another bubble right here. You know, worst comes to worst with a bubble, we can always uh, lance it and get it out that way. I'm trying to figure out what's the Path of least resistance. Oh, there we go. Okay. Now I'm looking, trying to use this, the light to my advantage because it'll help reveal any bubbles. Again, not bubbles in the pre mask, which you will see sometimes, bubbles in the actual artwork underneath that. Okay, I think, I think we're in good shape. So I'll come back. Yeah, that's in the, I think. Oh no, that's actually, is it? Well, sure. So like right on a crease where I think it was crushed a little bit in the packaging, but we'll get that out. It'll be okay. All right. So what I'm going to do now is um, spray the pre-mask again. This will soften the pre-mask and help us remove that off. And yeah, I'm getting... <sighs> Getting the um, wrap attack everywhere. Yeah, we'll have to figure out something with this crease. Okay. And uh, you want to peel it at a 45 degree angle. You don't want to peel it towards you because that will pull the, uh, the artwork off of the cabinet potentially. So you want to peel it at a 45 degree angle. Oh, wow, that looks good. That looks good. <laughs> a 
Holy cow. <laughs> and sorry if this is brutally slow. Oh my gosh, those colors, especially because you see it through the pre-mask and you just don't, you don't, you can't appreciate how bright and vibrant those colors are until you get, <laughs> get them open to the air. All right, going nice and slow. Yeah, we got a little wrinkle right there. That's okay. It's in the back of the cabinet. Unlikely for anyone to even see it or notice it. Look at that. Yeah, I like doing this type of side art. Like I've done uh, Donkey Kong like this. What else? Oh, we got some more wrinkles right there, but it's okay. We've got time. Maybe one air bubble in the O right there. Ooh, one right here too. Okay. Look at that. Okay. Let's, uh, I'm going to spend a couple minutes working on these uh, bubbles. Oh, those are coming out pretty easily. And uh, then I will do the other side. It'll be exactly the same way. Oh, and you got some glare here. And then uh, we will uh, take a look at the finished product together. Look at that. <laughs> and yeah, like I said, this, this uh, marquee ball is on its last leg. I'm going to have to pick uh, another one up real quick, but my goodness, did this project come out awesome. It's looking awesome in that marquee light. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Here's uh, the one side. Just looks absolutely amazing as we have our little our little penguin friend keeping a watchful eye on what we're doing. I think you might have seen him before. But yeah, and I just changed the shutter speed, so only the marquee light should be flickering, not the uh, not the monitor. Here's the side art on the other side. Both the coin door bulbs are lit, and those are the original bulbs, or at least the bulbs that were there when I got the cabinet. But awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, that flickering, that flickering light is going to drive me absolutely bonkers but uh, we'll get that replaced very very soon i am so happy with how this came out uh you know i'm gonna have to deal with the uh the inferior uh game music for a little bit i did shoot an email over to joe at highscoresaves.com i'm sure he'll get me uh, sorted out and there must be something i can do to kind of get that working but uh yeah look at this artwork and again uh the repro side art and the control panel overlay and the bezel all came from, uh, I think it's Rich and Kendra at This Old Game. Thank you very much for that. And the, uh, the marquee I got, this is an original marquee that I got from eBay. And yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, Todd Tucky from TNT is the one who sold me the working PCB. I won that at an auction, a recent auction of his. Uh, he does those, I think, monthly, uh, streaming live on YouTube. Uh, Todd Tucky, TNT Amusements, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you Dillweed for hooking me up with the uh, uh, dimensions and a drawing to be able to reproduce this uh, lower marquee bracket. Uh, thank you Russell for uh, showing me this really cool <laughs> stuffed penguin. And um, yeah, you know, this is normally at the end of the uh, doing a restoration series like this. I did this with Joust and uh, with, with Kangaroo. Uh, you know, I, I go, I try to thank everyone that helped me. So thank you, uh, everyone. I think I've touched uh, on most of the, uh, the heavy hitters from this project already. Uh, this is also where we would do some you know, in-depth gameplay, but uh, I'm going to do that uh, um, <laughs> live stream Monday night. You're probably watching this after that live stream. So uh, if, you, if you missed it, go back and watch. You'll get a, 
a good amount of Pango uh, gameplay and, and see me you know, make a fool of myself. Uh, I'm not good at any of these games. But uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I was just staring at this for a couple of minutes before I started filming. And uh, yeah, the blinking, the blinking marquee light was driving me nuts. But other than that, this looks so, so, so awesome. So yeah, I think we'll probably wrap it up here. Uh, <laughs> if this is your first time, go back and watch this whole restoration series from the beginning. I think this is part five. So not a particularly long project, you know, nothing like the, uh, the Joust, which was what, 12, maybe more uh, episodes long. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward one, a lot of fun, um, had a blast, and what an awesome game to add to my collection. And uh, yeah, so if this is your first time, watch all those old videos. I got a ton of these. I do videos like this every weekend. Sometimes, you know, I'll throw a short or something uh, during the week. Um, you know, subscribe if, if this is your first time to the channel so you don't miss any of those episodes. Uh, you know, please like, comment, share, all those things. All of that engagement really, really helps with the algorithm and, and helps you know, recommend, helps YouTube to recommend, you know, these kinds of videos to uh, other folks like you who might like to watch them. And a really, really, really special thank you to uh, all my uh, Overtime Arcade paid channel members. These are really, really awesome, generous folks who throw $1.99 a month uh, my way, which is about seven uh, cents a day uh, to support the channel. That really, really helps, means a ton to me. You know, we keep adding, adding new members, you know, several a week. Uh, our newest ones are actually folks that you might actually know. So uh, Jeff Kinder from What Would Jeff Kinder Do on, uh, on YouTube and the uh, Dragon's Lair Project. Jeff is an awesome guy. Thank you so much, Jeff. He does awesome restoration projects and has a killer collection. And also Jeremiah Jackson uh, from Coin Op Corner on, on YouTube. And also he's one of my co-hosts on the Coin Jam podcast. Uh, Jeremiah does lots of awesome coin op repairs, not just arcade machines, but also redemption machines and like gumball machines and vending machines. Awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, and, you know, I've met both uh, Jeff and Jeremiah in person and consider them friends. So really appreciate their support. But um, yeah, if you want to learn more about what it means to become an Overtime Arcade channel member, click that join button down below and you'll see what it's all about and all the perks you get, like uh, access to our private members only Discord, which is super active and a lot of fun. We do a monthly members only live stream uh, and you get early access to all new videos. So uh, this is actually Sunday night when I'm finishing this filming, which is really, really late. So they'll probably get access to it sometime overnight and then this will be released to the public on Sunday or Monday night. Um, so anyway, <laughs> enough rambling. Thank you everyone for all your support. I will wrap it up here. Uh, as always, you've been watching Overtime Arcade. I'm Charlie, and I'll see you next time. Oh, 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 overtime! overtime.